last time the UK Championships were in York was in 2006, just five years ago, but in snooker terms, a different era. History shows that nothing lasts forever, and it also tells us that when revolutions start, the world can change very, very quickly. Your appreciation for the runner-up, Stephen Hendry. I was in the final that year against Peter Ebden, and our combined age at the time was 73. Fast forward half a decade, and you wouldn't need carbon dating to establish the age of tonight's two finalists, who add up to just 47. Seven years younger than Steve Davis. But it's not just the age of the leading players that has changed. The stage they are performing on is almost unrecognisable. Gone are the outside tables. Gone is the dividing wall. And gone are the two session matches over 19 frames. And you can now watch two single session matches over 11 frames. Judging by the crowds, the changes are popular. Shortening the UK to best of 11, frankly, to the man on the street, is great news. They buy a ticket, they see a result in one session. Every player gets on television instead of half the players. Therefore, they've got more commercial opportunities and more chance to be famous. But what do the players make of all the changes? Opinion, unlike the view of the tables, is divided. I think it's good, you know, because when the other... The other fella's popping a lot of balls, I can watch the other game, you know, so, you know, I quite like that. It makes it quite hard to focus on your match, you know, because um, uh, somebody's sort of on the other table knocking a big break, it's quite easy to sort of glance over and, and lose focus of your own game. It's, it's best 11s and uh, everyone plays on the t TV table, uh, you know, with these other players in the tournament that, you know, probably would have been playing out the back uh, in the cubicles, which, you know, if you get to a venue, you should be playing on TV. In previous tournaments with the UK, I, I felt like the odd, the odd first session where I felt a little bit flat because there's no result, you know, but with the best of 11s, you can go out there and you know there's going to be a result. Me personally, I quite like it. I, I've really, really enjoyed the uh, best of 11 format. I think it's been a success. I think the fact so many people have turned out to watch us. And, and I think part, part of that is because they're guaranteed to see a result. You know, they can come and watch the snooker. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. We listen to our broadcast customers. We listen to our sponsors because this is very, very, there are very tough times out there now, economically, for everybody in Europe. And yet, we've bucked the trend. So, two years, have we made some mistakes? Yes, of course. And behind the reason for the changes, motivation. The same motivation that has shaped nations and driven empires, money. money. In 2006, we, we, we had about $50,000 coming in to, to World Snooker for our international broadcast. Um, this year, we'll probably hit uh, about $2.5 million. We've gone from eight tournaments to 28 events around the world. The prize money got in a recession market. The prize money's gone from three and a half million. Next year, it'll be seven and a half million. These are staggering, staggering figures for a game that was moribund. That extra money is the result of a game that has gone truly global. The explosion of popularity in China no longer makes the headlines, but is still remarkable. Next season, there will be more ranking tournaments on Snooker's new frontier. And though the traditionalists might feel faint, the future of the game seems to be heading east. I think most tournaments will be played in Asia in five years, um, and there will be a lot of uh, players from Asia that are capable of doing very well. Hopefully, I would say maybe three or four players that will be in the top 16 from Asia. Uh, the World Championships might be in China in five years, and the game is going to uh, grow worldwide. The demand in Asia is simply staggering. I think next year we'll probably end up with five, maybe six ranking events in Asia alone, and it could grow from there. But China is now only half the story. This season has seen tournaments as far afield as Brazil and Australia. 
And in Europe, the snooker caravan has pulled up in Poland, Belgium and Germany. We've got talks going on with Turkey, Russia, Canada, Singapore. And so we're looking at uh, a really strong future. More tournaments and more money. Who could be unhappy? Well, the answer is quite a few people. Because in this seemingly happy marriage between money and tournaments, there is a third person in the form of ranking points. Back in the good old days, if you managed to get your place in the top 16, you were there for the whole season. It was your passport to guaranteed prize money and a place in every tournament. But these days, the only passport you get is the one that takes you on planes, trains and automobiles to long-haul destinations and shorter trips in the UK and Europe on the Players' Tour Championship, or PTCs as they are universally known. This year's PTC in Antwerp was typical. 128 players, including amateurs from around Europe, 14 of the top 16, and a host of battle-hardened professionals aiming to get enough points to take their place in the top echelon. We've got to change some more of the structures where we give the top players too much protection. Seeded through to so many final stages, guaranteed so much money. We've got to take away that, we've got to create the hunger, we've got to spread the game globally, and we've got to increase the prize money. My aim is to get the prize money up to £10 million, minimum, and to have a snooker tournament somewhere in the world every week. Not all the players are quite so enthusiastic about the scheduling or the prize money on PTCs. Oh, no, I enjoy the PTC events. I just, the only thing I don't like is that you don't get paid in them and sometimes you go to them and you lose money. But I like playing in them, I think they're great. Um, but, you know, it's not fun when you go into these PTC events and you're making the final and maybe coming away making a couple of grand. But I think the ranking, the way the ranking system's a lot better now, so for the lower players, if they are doing well, it shows in the rankings by the way the, the ranking system is being done, where before they could have a good season and it probably wouldn't really show that much. It's not really a criticism, but I just think the scheduling could be a little bit better, so we're not away like every week so often because obviously I don't get to see much of my, fam like my family and friends and stuff like that, but I know this is my job. This week in York, the murmurs of discontent turned into a one-man chorus of rebellion as Mark Allen fired a broadside at Barry Hearn and Snooker's new world order. Not been one to shy away from speaking my mind and I think that's what players need to start doing more of because there's too many people that have said exactly what I said amongst themselves but they're not, not uh, man enough to say it to the public and say it to the journalists and have it documented. Obviously I've been criticised for swearing on TV or when my press conference, which I hold my hand up and say I shouldn't have done that. Obviously, it's not setting a good example, but I stand by everything else that I said. Behind the headlines and the showmanship were some serious issues. Though going through established diplomatic channels might have been more productive and less contentious. Well, Mark Allen's comments were disappointing. Players, company, the WPBSA, they're also on our main board, and they also own 26%, by the way, of World Snooker. So we have to listen to them. Uh, and the players' company, under Jason Ferguson's excellent leadership, actually has reg regular meetings with players so that we hear the views of the players before we make decisions. I have to tell you that Mark Allen has never once attended any of those meetings, so he obviously doesn't feel very strong enough about it to take the trouble to put his point to his own association. So what to make of it all? Well, your perspective probably depends on a number of factors. Your age, your ranking position, and your family commitments, amongst others. One thing is certain, the changes over the past two seasons amount to nothing less than a revolution in the structure of the game. And if you fail to adapt to the new environment, your days are numbered. <laughs>